Welcome back and welcome to section four, where we're going to take a look at some of the next generation serverless data processing tools offered by Amazon AWS. So first of all, let's have a brief overview of what we're going to cover in this section. First of all, we're going to start by taking a look at Amazon Athena and Redshift Spectrum, which are two of the latest and greatest big data processing tools from Amazon, both of which are less than six months old and really are hot off the press uh, from the Amazon reInvent conference late last year. So we're going to take a look at what each of those are, how they work, and how they interact together to make your life a little bit easier when it comes to processing large volumes of data. Next, we'll take a look at virtual schemas and what they are and how we create them with Amazon Athena. And then we're going to use the schemas that we've created to do a little bit of serverless data processing on a data set example that's stored directly on Amazon S3. And finally, I'll be giving you an overview of how to use Redshift Spectrum to join data in Amazon S3 with data that already lives in your Redshift cluster. So let's jump right into the content. So firstly, what is Amazon Athena? So Amazon Athena is a fully managed interactive query service that lets you run standard SQL queries against data that's stored in Amazon S3. Now remember that Amazon S3 is simply a, a storage bucket. It's a place to dump your data in the cloud uh, and you can interact with it using multiple services. So what Amazon Athena brings to the table is the ability to basically just write SQL queries against data that's stored on this storage layer. So you don't actually need to import it into any other tool. So recall in the previous section, we looked at how we could take data in S3 and pull it into an Aurora RDS database, and also how we could take data in S3 and pull it into a Redshift data warehouse. With Athena, we don't actually need to do either of those things. We can just write SQL code and execute it directly against that data in Amazon S3. And the really cool thing about Athena is it's fully serverless and completely scalable. So Amazon manages all the infrastructure that runs behind Athena, and all you have to do is worry about the queries that you're writing and not the infrastructure or scalability that's going on behind the scenes. So Amazon Athena is based on the Presto SQL engine, which is a massively parallel processing engine originally developed at Facebook. Now Presto was built to perform really high speed, low latency analytics on data stored in Hadoop. And this is a bit of an irony really, because Hadoop has got a bit of a reputation in the industry for being very slow, very low latency, but the only framework that's capable of processing large amounts of data. Now over the last three or four years, a number of alternatives have arisen to the typical MapReduce paradigm used by Hadoop. This started out about five or six years ago with a technology called Hive, which was also developed by Facebook. Uh, and Hive is basically a way of running SQL against Hadoop. So what it does is it translates SQL queries into MapReduce uh, jobs, which then return your data. Now the problem is with this, MapReduce in itself is a batch-based system and is quite slow. So in the last three or four years, a number of companies have come out with alternative query engines um, for performing this kind of analytics on data stored in Hadoop. Now perhaps the best known of these is Spark and Spark SQL, which is a, an alternative to Presto. We also have Presto. We have a technology called Apache Drill, uh, which is produced by one of the big data specialization companies called MapR. And there's also in, uh, Apache Impala, which is from Cloudera, a MapR competitor. So what Amazon have basically done is they've exposed S3 as a Hadoop compatible file system and then allows you to interact with it directly. So you can still actually create an EMR cluster. EMR is Amazon's Elastic MapReduce technology, which is basically a one-click deploy of Hadoop. And you can point that at S3 if you want, and you can write MapReduce jobs against S3 directly. Um, but what they've done with Athena is basically wrapped this, this query service, this Presto query engine, uh, into a fully managed query layer. So you can just start analyzing data in S3 immediately. So previously, if you wanted to use something like Presto or Spark SQL or Impala or Drill, uh, you would have had to spin up an Amazon EMR cluster or roll your own Hadoop cluster on EC2, uh, configure it all yourself, and then either point it at S3 
or load the data onto local disks directly, not dissimilar to what you were doing with Redshift. Uh, so the difference here is you just have to, you just give Amazon the query uh, and they just go off and execute it, a little bit similar to uh, Google's BigQuery technology. And Amazon handle the scaling of the query infrastructure automatically to maintain performance across near infinite data sets. In terms of file formats, Athena is compatible with a number of text and binary file formats. Uh, obviously CSV is supported. You can also query JSON data files. And there's a couple of binary files that are quite popular in the big data space as well. Notably ORC, uh, perhaps most common of all is Apache Parquet, which is a columnar binary file format. Uh, and also Avro, which is again another binary format with a schema attached to it. However, much like Hive or Spark or any of these other Hadoop query engines, Athena needs to know some metadata about your data. So essentially the way it works is you create something called an external table. So this is an externally managed table, it just describes the schema for your data. So you can, this, this is basically just a create table statement and you create what's known as a virtual table, uh, which describes the schema for your data. And all you're doing is defining the columns and the data formats and the data types that the query engine should expect when interacting with your data. Now the big difference here is this is known as a schema on read approach. So think when you think about your data, it's actually just data sitting on a file system somewhere, in this case, Amazon S3. So you're writing the data to the file system and then telling the query engine what schema it should expect when it reads those files. Now, conversely, think about how this works with something like Redshift or MySQL or any other database type technology where you actually define that table up front and then write data into the table, which you could think of as an internal table. So there's a very clear contrast here. With something like Athena, you can have one file and multiple schemas for that file, and you define that schema at the time you want to read it, versus a database where you have to define the schema up front and then write data into that table. So then you can, once you've created this external table, you can just go ahead and query and join these tables as though they were managed tables in any other database. And the cool thing is the query engine handles the file operations transparently under the hood. So you can write select statements, you can do averages, you know, sums, aggregations, joins, window functions, all of this kind of anti-SQL stuff. But actually what's happening under the hood is the query engine is just processing files on the file system. And the big benefit here is it means you don't have to do any ETL, you don't have to do any transformation, you don't have to munge your data into a specific format for a table that's, that's predefined. You just write the schema for the file that you've got and you can go ahead and process it and query it right off the bat. In terms of pricing, as you'd expect, and as with all AWS products, you really only pay for what you use. So with Athena, you're charged based on the amount of data that your query scans. So if you write a big select statement or a big join or a big aggregation that has to scan the entire data set, Amazon will calculate how much, of, how much data actually gets read into memory and then charges you based on that. So with Athena, you're charged at a rate of $5 per terabyte. And this scan calculation is rounded up to the nearest megabyte with a minimum of 10 megabytes per query. So in our examples, we're just going to be querying a file that's a few hundred kilobytes, but Amazon will round that up to 10 megabytes, which is still next to nothing. As a side note, as with Redshift, uh, Athena supports both compression and columnar file formats. So thinking about compression particularly, if you compress your files on disk, you're going to be having much smaller amounts of data that get scanned by your queries, so your costs will be much, much lower. Uh, and, and on top of that, as we were talking about with Redshift, because CPUs are so fast and so efficient at decompressing data these days, uh, there's not really any performance penalty for compressing your data on disk. In fact, quite conversely, usually we see a huge performance benefit with data that's compressed on disk, because the disk I.O. is usually actually the slowest part of the operation followed by the network shuffle. So the way massively parallel processing frameworks work is there's often a shuffle phase in a query, particularly with a join operation, where data needs to be moved around between nodes on a network. Now, if that data is compressed, that can happen much, much faster. 
The second thing to con consider, of course, is columnar file formats. Now, typically, the main reason for using a framework like Athena is because we want to do lots of aggregation and BI type queries. So, of course, if our data is in a columnar format, we only actually need to load the columns that we're selecting and that we're aggregating rather than all the rows in a table. In terms of access, Athena can be used via the AWS console. So they have a, a web console, a web UI, uh, and it looks very similar to Hue. So if you've ever used a Hadoop distribution, Hue is the Hadoop user experience. It's just a Hadoop UI. Uh, and we're going to see in a couple of videos time, the Athena UI looks almost identical. And of course, there's also a JDBC driver if you want to access things programmatically. So when should you use Athena? Well, first of all, comparing it to Hadoop, a lot of Hadoop type use cases actually are just purely SQL operations. Uh, quite often we see um, use cases where you've got a data warehouse that's just growing too big and you want to start looking at things like Hadoop so you can keep a full history of your data. Uh, if you have a use case where, where you're purely running ad hoc, you know, daily or weekly queries against large volumes of data, perhaps you don't need a Hadoop cluster. Uh, if you want, you know, purely low touch ad hoc SQL queries against data, then maybe Athena is a good alternative to Hadoop. You know, on the flip side, Hadoop is much more capable, much more flexible technology if you want to perform more advanced analytics. With Hadoop, you can scale pretty much anything you can think of and anything you can code uh, up to vast quantities of data, whereas Athena, of course, is just restricted to pure SQL. And versus Redshift, the water's muddy a little bit more. So Redshift is kind of like somewhere between Athena and a database. So it offers much greater performance controls. You can create things like temporary tables, for example. Of course, you can control the size of your cluster and the type of nodes that you're using. Uh, and it tends to be faster for extremely complex business intelligence and reporting type queries. So things with lots of inner and outer joins, potentially sub queries, a large, large amount of aggregations, for example, tend to perform better on Redshift because there's more highly optimized and probably the data that you stored there is in a format that's a tighter coupling to your business use case. However, of course, as we've discussed, Redshift enforces a schema at right time just like a database, whereas Athena does not. And Athena also supports uh, both structured and unstructured data. So next we've got Redshift Spectrum, which I think actually Amazon is a little bit of a con for us to, to refer to it as a technology or a query engine itself, because really what Redshift Spectrum is, is an integration between Redshift and the Athena query engine. So Redshift Spectrum allows you to essentially run Redshift SQL queries against data in S3 and then join that data with data that you already have in Redshift. So Redshift Spectrum really is just a powerful integration with Amazon Athena for cross data source querying. So it basically just allows you to query your hot data in Redshift and then combine it with cold data stored in S3. And there are actually a lot of use cases for this type of operation. So for example, you might have your, your business intelligence data in Redshift, and then you might have web clickstream data, for example, um, sitting in raw uh, web server log files on S3. Now, instead of spending a lot of time doing an ETL process to get that into Redshift, uh, perhaps you actually only want to query that data once a month to get end of month traffic statistics. So now, instead of having to pump that data into Redshift and pay to store it in Redshift, which is much more expensive, we can write a query that joins the data in Redshift that perhaps contains ad campaign information and click pay-per-click pricing with those red ser um, web server logs on S3 and combine the results into a single place. In terms of pricing and mechanics, it's exactly the same as Athena, just that the queries are written against Redshift. And when you run a query, the Redshift query optimizer launches an Athena task for data in S3 and combines the output with a conventional Redshift execution path.